talk about measurement, I, I think perhaps some of you feel like I do that there's a lot of data in the world. There's a lot of information. So what, is, what matters? What actually is it that matters? What is it that makes a difference? Some of us have been working in development for a few decades. I think Pierre's comments to how thorny these wicked problems are are very true. And we haven't found, despite the billions of dollars being invested, effective ways to really get to sustainability. And for us, the key to this data, the key to this kind of work, is the democratization of data. It isn't a, a zero-sum game. It isn't a place, unlike most aspects of competitiveness, where you knowing something that someone else doesn't know is an advantage. It is the opposite. The more people share and understand what's working, the better we're able to affect what is a huge multidimensional issue. So the idea of democratization to me is that this data should live and work and be shared in collective impact, shared with the producers that we work with who are not the subjects of projects, who are not just the partners in the supply chain. They literally create what this industry is, and not just this one, but agriculture in general. So to me, and, and this is what turns uh, older men on in my business, so you'll, <laughs> you'll have to excuse me. It is, it is not the map of Italy necessarily at night, though that's attractive as well, uh, is data. So get this one, because this is interesting. And, the trajectory that this planet takes as it goes around the sun varies from a straight line only one ninth of an inch, one ninth of an inch every 18 miles. Okay? That's the arc of our orbit. If it varied one tenth of an inch, it would be an ice ball. We would all freeze to death. The orbit would be huge. We wouldn't be near the sun. If it varied one eighth of an inch, we would all be incinerated. Right? And one-eighth of an inch along 18 miles, even to an agricultural economist, looks like a straight line, right? So it looks pretty straight, but it isn't. There's a huge difference in the trajectory of what occurs over time. And knowing that difference is vital. It's especially vital when we're working on a finite edge. So I'm not here to bring you bad news about the environment and sustainability. You all have heard it a thousand times. You don't need me to tell you that there's a finite space to work in this field. We have to act, and we have to act intelligently. We, should, we need to do that now. Especially if you consider, as Pierre and some of the other speakers mentioned, the fact that food and coffee coexist. There are a lot of agricultural choices besides coffee. And if, in the next 30 years, we're going to have to double our food production on this planet at a minimum, double our food production on, the, on, this, on this planet, within the current footprint that it takes for us to produce that, then we need to clearly get a lot smarter about what we do. We need to understand what to measure, and we need to then use that data to manage it. In other words, data that that works, data that has a business sense to it, data that is tangible, data that enables you to make a different investment, choose an alternative policy, scale something up or not. Basically, from a business perspective, understanding the ROI of what we're investing in, right? And not, and not waiting five years for a project to close to figure that out. The idea of archaeology, which is what most scientists work in, looking at data after the fact, doesn't work for sustainability. It doesn't work to learn those lessons three or four years later. We need to get them in real time. It may shock some of you that most of the programs, most of the initiatives, most of the investments we see today are practice-based. Do this, and things hopefully will work out. <laughs> Do many of you run your businesses that way? Do you run, those of you who manage projects, is that how you manage things? Just yeah, come in, make sure you respond to 60 emails today, uh, and make sure you make, get a few phone calls in, and, and you'll be fine, everything will work, right? Is that, that's sufficient, right? That's how we measure sustainability, fundamentally. 
The vast majority of the programs out there are measured in, in this way. They're not performance-based. And I would posit, I would propose to you that we really need to look at this like we look at a business. We need to succeed at sustainability even more critically than we need to succeed at any individual business, because it's about, it's about everyone. So this idea that we're still running programs, that we're still running programs based not on real metrics, not on performance, but on practice, is on the edge of absurd, and many of you are part of that process, and I am inviting you to consider some alternatives to be more effective. Let me show you what that looks like in a piece of data that we gathered a few years ago from four different groups using the, this is in Tanzania, uh, control groups, because we always look at control groups. We don't know what we're doing. We think we have success, but then the control group's doing just as well, uh, despite all that money. So clearly, it wasn't the project, right? So we look at, at things a bit rigorously. But in this data from Tanzania, one of the indicators we look at, we look at many, are children registered in school, right? It was one way of understanding a community and, and what, where the future is going. And we used the bog standard approach, right, of, that the UN and many uh, researchers use to see how many children are registered in school. And you look at the data and you think, eh, you know, not terribly motivating for a policymaker or for a company to go in and deal with education with these kinds of numbers, perhaps a bit with that last group on, on your far right, but, but typically not. We realized when we started to work with local communities and talk about the data, this idea of democratizing data, we, start, we understood that we didn't get it. We didn't understand what was really going on. We didn't understand because while people were registered in school, kids were registered in school, you've got 13-year-olds that are in the first grade. Yeah, they're registered, but they don't have teachers, so they don't get anywhere, or they don't have books or they don't have school fees each year to keep things going, or they have to work on the farm. So they don't get a chance to actually take advantage of school. They're just technically registered. This is the wrong data, right? When we redid that data, this, makes, this made me cry when I first heard it. I'll admit that to you, because this is, knowing these communities, this is utterly tragic. When we asked about each child's age, and correlated that to what's the, what is the average in that country, not in the UK, not here, in that country, what's the average school level that that child should be in, we got this result. And this is tragic. Because these are the kids who are reading the pesticide labels, who are making the contracts with an exporter, who are learning about more effective ways to grow coffee or indeed any crop, this is horrific, and it's a very different picture. This one doesn't tell you much. Understanding good data and understanding it with a community gives you access to making a difference. And that difference might be a couple of kids in a village, but that's the difference that can sometimes alter the trajectory of that community. It's powerful. Data can be powerful. It doesn't work in the hands of just a few. This idea of it being democratic is powerful in that it, it accelerates, it expands it to whole new levels. And we believe, as an organization, we need to work together to have a collective impact. We're all working in these little silos, including huge agencies. My former employers in, in Washington and, and many organizations that work in their own silos because they're all absolutely brilliant. But none of them is as brilliant as all of us together getting together to get the, the lessons, to learn from each other to balance the innovation that we need to have, but the rigor to measure it and know what's working and what isn't, right? And doing all of that, by the way, this is now far beyond science, with a business pragmatism, common sense, cost-effective, just-in-time, now, workable, not a nice idea to think about, how do I improve things now? I need to know that answer. That's what I need to do. For us, that means a few things. First, it means having common tools. And that means having a language that we share in common. 
having indicators that are important, learning lessons. Our job as a nonprofit is to learn lessons from our, the many members of the consortia. So that group, a sampling of which you see, includes UN agencies, they have their understanding of things. It includes NGOs, radical left, radical right, doesn't matter. It includes financial institutions, Root Capital, uh, IFC, and others. It includes uh, standards bodies, certification agencies that work in sustainability. Of course, it includes farmer groups, the Federation, the Junta, others, Ana Café, in the past. And it includes institutions at origin. Very much so, the research institutions in each country are the ones that drive the work with us. That context, understanding the reality of their space, is vital. I think Michael pointed it out very well. Once he dug into Nariño, right, understanding what's really going on, gave them some really powerful answers. That wasn't done from an office in the U.S. It was done with local partners. It was done understanding a process with a lot of different perspectives. Part of the beauty of what may have seemed like a simple answer that he gave you, brilliantly, I might say, is that it came from a lot of different activities, a lot of different brains, and a lot of different sets of experience coming together. When you get that global learning, when you learn in Guatemala and can share it with Vietnam, when your Vietnam work comes back to Colombia, when that scoots over to Ghana, constant beneficial learning that we each have, we each learn how to do it a little better. And that is how we get to sustainability. It isn't one of us. It, there is no one in this room, probably, who's brilliant enough to have all the answers of how to do it. And the answers, by the way, are contextual. They're different in each country. We've done tens of thousands of data sets, surveys in different countries, and I can tell you that what I've learned is that it's contextually different in each place. There's no one answer. So you have to embed the knowledge, the capacity in local people, in the local space, right? Because they're the ones who are going to determine for themselves and with you how it's going to work. And it's going to be different in Tanzania than it is in Brazil. There's just no question about that, okay? So how we do that, this idea of standardization, we have over 100 indicators. They've evolved over a decade. They've been tested time and again with dozens and dozens of different projects. They've been run through hundreds of, of partners. And the idea of having a common language is what enables us to communicate. Did you measure that? Oh, okay, we know that. We have a common language in everything. If I tell you it's a certain degree temperature outside, you know what I mean. If I tell you what time, we've all agreed that we're using a watch, right? If I'm communicating financial principles, if I'm looking at a balance sheet, you know, you know what I'm talking about because you account for things in the same way. So we don't have that language in sustainability. It's kind of shocking. And we need to. We need to have a common language. So one of the models I'd like to share with you is one that we're working with a number of, of global partners, multinational firms in, in some cases, but, but one of the most interesting ones for me personally is a, a project with Farmer Brothers that just uh, is scaling up in Colombia and now we're, we're starting to run it in Central America. And it runs on what I think is, or what our learning has told us, is one of the models for the future. And it's not just about, do you certify or not certify? Do you run a project? Not. It's about creating the framework for success. So the first thing is, unlike most projects that have an idea, we're bringing a new hybrid, we're going to build a school. You, know, you come with your idea, right? <laughs> and someone usually says, yes, so on you go. The first thing they do is assess conditions. Having those common indicators enables us to do that transparently and to determine the hotspots, to determine the areas to work in. With that information, you can sit down with all the stakeholders and prioritize what it is that they need and you're willing to do. And that's what Farmer Brothers is doing in this case. They're deciding what they're going to invest in and asking the community to invest jointly with them in those processes. And they're not stupid. So they don't want to invest just to invest, they want to have a return on that money, obviously, right? A, a substantial return that isn't measured just economically. And so they need measures to understand rigorously what's working and what isn't, so they can either dial back the things that aren't working, which are useless, or scale up the things that do work. I know that sounds like it's common sense, doesn't it? It is. And yet it isn't done in most projects. 
We come with a lot of predetermined ideas and poor metrics, so we don't really know how to succeed, but we check the boxes. We trained 1,000 farmers. Oh, yeah. Got them trained. Got it. We exported an extra 200 tons. Great. That's not success. Those are not indicators of performance. Right? So if you have the right metrics, you can begin to understand against control groups. You can see where you're having success and where you're not because you're measuring the same thing in different places. In this project, which is with the uh, Ana Café, Fidico Cagua, SCAN, is a project from McDonald's in, in Central America, in, in Guatemala, we can see that in different regions, the same exact intervention has very different results. And we can begin to tweak and fine tune and learn the lessons from certain regions that will apply to other regions with similar characteristics, not keep replicating a one-size-fits-all approach. The beauty of having data be alive and local is you can then put it into a dashboard. And by a dashboard, most of you know, I mean, you know, when you're driving, you want to be able to look down at your speedometer or whatever it is you're looking at for a quick understanding of what's working and what isn't. In this case, you can see a dozen, four social, four environmental, and four economic indicators that a manager can check in real time in their own supply chain at relatively low cost to see what's happening. Am I heading in the right direction? Are my teams working well in that or are they not? What do I need to tweak? Not two years after a project is done. This week. This week, right? That's what we need to know. So in closing, five key principles that I would share with you that would help to advance sustainability from the perspective at least of metrics. The first one is having common indicators, reducing a lot of the confusion when a thousand people have decided this is the best way to measure cost of production. Why not just measure it that way? If you have a better way, by all means, contribute. But let's not keep reinventing wheels. We, we really don't need to at this point. It's been done a lot. And that includes the work we do with FAO, Sustainable Food Lab, uh, the Dutch Sustainable Trade Initiative, the Ford Foundation, the Inter-American Development Bank. I mean, this is done in a lot of places already. So there's, there's already a fair bit of agreement. Standardizing is critical, not just for assessment, obviously, but also to better design projects. If you know from the beginning what you're going to be measured, what success is, you'll be able to do that effectively. Local capacity is how you get relevant. Having that local capacity is critical for this to work. It's part of that democratization of data that we're talking about. Having a multi-dimensional view that isn't just economic, though of course that's important, but if you have a trade-off where you've clear-cut a hillside to get better productivity, that may not be a, the, the right balance of things. And finally, looking at things as best practices. What's the international validity? What have we learned over decades of doing this kind of work? What do we learn from other agencies that are spending billions of dollars doing this so that we're not reinventing wheels? And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening, and I invite you to join, participate, contribute. It's an open consortium. Thank you very much. <laughs>